per me è un grande piacere essere qui ed onore con voi collegato all'inizio di questo webinar. Eh, ci, te ci tenevo molto ad esserci per darvi intanto un grande messaggio di, di sostegno, supporto e amicizia da parte del, del nostro Consolato eh, d'Italia qui a New York. Stiamo attraversando tutti insieme eh, gli italiani qui di New York, insieme a tutti i dati new yorkesi, un periodo, una fase molto molto delicata e credo che sia bello anche in questa circostanza dimostrare e sottolineare l'importanza della nostra unità e l'importanza del, del supporto che gli italiani riescono reciprocamente sempre a darci. Eh, vorrei dire molto brevemente che il consolato è, è sempre aperto nelle modalità in cui è aperta anche la scuola d'Italia, cioè nelle nuove modalità da, da, da remoto ed in forma eh, diciamo sia telefonica che che anche di, 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 di posta elettronica, apriamo solo una volta alla settimana per le urgenze indifferibili, eh, però siamo contattabili 24 ore su 24 per qualsiasi esigenza, abbiamo rafforzato anche le linee di emergenza e quindi siamo sempre pronti se anche con le segnalazioni che vorrete farci eh, voi. Eh, colgo l'occasione per fare un grande elogio eh, una volta di più alla Scuola d'Italia che è eh, sta utilizzando questo periodo, questa fase così, così difficile per, eh, per continuare l'attività didattica online in una maniera veramente incommiabile e positiva e allo stesso tempo eh, sta trovando delle occasioni di incontro come queste molto importanti. Io ringrazio e congratulo non solo la nostra carissima preside Maria che è sempre veramente un, un elemento di, di, di unione, di entusiasmo, di passione verso la comunità della scuola, verso tutti noi italiani qui a New York, eh, ma anche Stefania, la dottoressa Stefania Clementi, la bravissima psicologa che cura tutti gli aspetti della, di psicologia della scuola, e Silvana Riggio, la dottoressa Silvana Riggio, che so che è in collegamento anche lei qui. Eh, state dando un'ulteriore dimostrazione di uh, how much the Italians here in New York are united, the strength of this uh, invaluable Italian community. And I think that also through the, the, the conversation of today, we'll, uh, we'll learn many important things. And um, I want to highlight that uh, La Scuola d'Italia has a perfect combination of the resiliency of the Italians, of the New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So we feel that uh, optimistic also in this very uh, difficult uh, phase, moment, period, that we'll get through it and we'll do that together because the Italian community uh, of New York is, is a great community, is uh, made of great people, of families. Your school is the best expression of that. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, through the common efforts of everyone, we'll, uh, this community will, uh, will be better and better. So I'm very proud of that, grazie mille, buon pomeriggio a tutti e diciamocelo, viva l'Italia, viva New York, perché in questi giorni più che mai we feel connected more than ever, Italy and New York. Thank you. Grazie, Console Genuardi, ce la faremo, senz'altro. Um, let's go back now to our program. I want to thank Stefania Clementi for organizing not only the webinar, but also the extensive wellness program for La Scuola, which is now in its third year, and uh, give my welcome to uh, our dear friend, uh, Dr. Silvana Riggio, who has been busy with patients. Um, she's a medical doctor, she's a psychiatrist, you will know, you will hear more about her. But she has taken time to join us at La Scuola, and we cannot thank her enough for doing this. So welcome, uh, Dr. Uh, Silvana Riggio, and Stefania, it's all yours. Thank you. It's mine. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I don't know if you see the flyer. Okay, we are still there. So thank you, everyone. So today's webinar uh, is born with the idea of just sitting down with you, with all the La Scuola community, and uh, to discuss about COVID-19, somehow to take stock of all the information that we receive every day because we receive a lot of them from different parts of the world from our friends in italy from the news and sometimes these are uh, information that are uh, confused and not details enough there is a lot of uh, misinformation as well so we decided that it was about time to be all on the same page and to ask a very reliable source uh, like 
Silvana, uh, how we can protect ourselves from uh, COVID-19. So Silvana Riggio, everybody knows her. Uh, she's amazing. She's our uh, scientific advisor. And she works every day nonstop uh, at Mount Sinai Hospital in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurology. And she deals, she and her team deals every day with patients um, affected by COVID-19. And the same thing is happening also to her husband who works in the same hospital in the Department of uh, Emergency, in the emergency room. So I don't think that there is anyone better than her uh, to, to give us, uh, you know, to tell us more about what are the precautions that we need to use to stay healthy, both physically and mentally speaking. So I, before leaving the word to her, I just would like to add that between yesterday and today, I collected some of your questions. They're very interesting. And we're gonna ask her to uh, answer this question at the end of the presentation. If you have additional questions, you can send an email to me and I'll make sure that Silvana could ask them either via email or maybe we can organize another webinar in the next uh, few weeks. Thank you so much and I leave the word to Silvana. Thank you, all of you, for this very generous introduction. My head now is very, very full. Uh, thank you, really, for organizing this forum and for inviting me to be part of the forum. And I'm, um, I'm going to be. I'm glad to meet, though I won't see you very much. So pay attention not to be constantly bombarded by the negative in uh, information and not focus on what we can do to help ourselves and your and our children. Okay, so I'm going to start with the, uh, you can start with the slide on the general information and what we know and what we can do to help ourselves. Next. Okay. Well, in fact, I did, I didn't introduce myself. But yes, and rehabilitation medicine and human performance at Mount Sinai. I serve as the primary medical advisor for the National Football League and my director of the consultation liaison service also at the Veterans Hospital and in the capacity uh, I run a consultation uh, liaison service. Um, so I do uh, see patient uh, Sinai at the Veterans Hospital and deal also with the athletes. Okay, so today we'll be the, the, uh, started with the general information, what we do know and what we can do to help ourselves to stay healthy from a physical, but also from an emotional point of view. So I'm gonna start talking about the general virus characteristic, incubation time, spread modality. Dr. Clementi and Dr. Palandra asked me to talk about that. I'll go back Actually. to it. Uh, the virus characteristic incubation time, how the virus spreads, which is what we need to know to keep ourselves safe, and then the clinical manifestation and also the impact on behavior, which is an area that is not very much talked about, but we will talk about tonight because it's the behavioral component and the, the role that it plays into our behavior. So, and then we talk about prevention and the difference strategy. Next, please. Okay, so we do know that this uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, is part of the coronavirus family. Of their, um, viruses pass between animals and humans. The novel co coronavirus is now called SARS-CoV-2, uh, which causes the COVID-19 was first identified by now we all know in China on December 31st, 2019. It is still unclear really where the virus originated. We think that the origin was uh, the database of the gene genetic sequence, sequence of the virus tell us that it probably originated in the seafood market in Wuhan, and that is uh, originated from bats. But interesting enough, bats are not sold at the Wuhan market. So the other hypothesis is that it was transmitted through an intermediate animal that is the pangolin, that is very much sold in China as a, an aphrodisiac. And uh, very expensive, by the way. Next, please. So we're talking about the incubation period. The incubation period is about two to 14 days 
with a median of about five, four to five days from the exposure. For people who are hospitalized, it seems that the, the median is about eight days. And on patients that get intubated is about 10 days. Next, please. So the virus is detected in the upper respiratory um, apparatus and the way, and it seems that it's there already one to two days prior to the symptom onset. And I'm sure you've t you heard about the asymptomatic patient. And this has been the biggest problem with this virus, which is not really common to the other influenza virus. The major spread or a big part of the spread is occurring through um, the asymptomatic patient. And we will talk more about that, okay? Don't want to create a paranoia, but I want to address how we can still protect ourselves from the asymptomatic patients because they, they are way. So one to two, day, two days prior to the symptom is already present in the upper respiratory um, uh, apparatus and we can uh, check it with the swab. Eventually it persists seven to 12 days in moderate cases and about two to three weeks in, in severe cases. So even after you had it, up to two, three weeks, you can still be positive, okay? And again, the median number of, the, uh, of this is two or three days from the exposure to be positive. So it could be that you test too early and you are negative, but then the day after you would be positive. The risk factor are diabetes, hypertension, ob obesity, immunocompromised patients, patient with active cancer and on chemotherapy in a population. So if you want to even alter attention though, I really believe at this point with the data that we have had in the States and in New York where 20 to, um, to about 30 to 40% are between age 20 and 50, I think we are all vulnerable. Some of you do it in the one, two days before, you may turn out to be negative and you think, oh, I'm negative, but in fact, the day after you're positive, it depends if the, 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 when they do the swab, they should ask you to blow your nose first, tilt your head up, and then twist the swab for 10, 15 seconds. So in the beginning, the test was recommended for people that just came out of China. Then it was recommended if you had an exposure or you came out of the Italy. Then it was only if you were exposed to somebody that was positive. Now the reality in New York, we are all exposed, okay? So it would have been ideal to do what they've done in South Korea, to do a testing on everybody, but it didn't happen. So what is happening now in most hospitals is that you come in and you need to be admitted. So they do test you because we need to figure out which part of the hospital are you going to be placed in the COVID area or in the non-COVID area, okay? Uh, if you have a fever or a cough, but you don't have respiratory problem, then you will not necessarily get tested and you're going to be sent home. In fact, the recommendation now that if you have fever and a cough, that you call your physician and don't go to the emergency department. The last thing we want to be is be together with the hundreds of other people who are positive, because we know that if you don't have respiratory distress, you're going to be sent home and uh, encouraged to drink a lot of liquid and to stay in isolation. You know, uh, back to the testing is not 100%. So even if you do it today, you know, and you're negative doesn't mean that tomorrow you're not positive. So what we say, if you have symptoms, you have to be isolated, period. And, uh, and, and that's what we, what we recommend because, again, a negative test does not mean that you didn't have it. It could mean you did it too early. could mean that it wasn't done properly. So the, if you don't feel well, if you have even minimal symptoms, stay in, in isolation. We'll talk about what isolation means. So the spectrum of the disease varies from very mild to severe and critical. 
Now, I want to remind everybody that many of the statistics that we hear out there are based on the severe and critical population, in people that come to the hospital and end up in the ICU. Because most of the people, and many of us, might have had old family member, might have had symptoms with minimal fever, 37.5 to 38.5, cough, yeah, and, uh, and but then feel okay, maybe only for a day or two, and might have had corona. Those don't enter in the statistical curve because we never will learn about them, okay? So there are so many, I have 10 of my residents at home with cough and fever, okay? Mild, mild symptoms. We have other staff, same thing, and some of them have come back to work, their symptom three weeks ago, and are already back to work and to do well. So despite the fact that this is a bad virus and we do have to pay attention, on the other hand, keep in mind that uh, there are many of us who have mild symptoms. It seems that it's like 80% or 81% of, of all the population who never comes to the attention, to the medical attention, okay? That's something to remember. Not to leave our guard down because the risk is too high for that and we don't want that to happen to any of us. Next, please. So symptoms. Uh, the most common, as we said, fever, muscle ache, headaches, uh, rhinorrhea, sore throat. So rhinorrhea is dripping of the nose, sore throat. For some people, it's just that feeling of uncomfortable feeling of chest tightness, cough. The respiratory distress, dyspnea, um, so if nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I had two patients this morning that presented with diarrhea and they're COVID positive, okay? I saw them in a consultation using service and they were all the, the anxious because they read enough and sure enough, they were right. So also uh, anosmia, has been described, next please. Loss of smell and taste has been associated with COVID-19. Uh, the bottom line is, if there's something different, uh, oh, absence of fever does not rule out COVID-19. And as I said, gastric symptoms, though they are uncommon, they can precede the respiratory uh, problem, okay? And sometimes at chest x-ray, we found that it's been normal early on. That also doesn't exclude a COVID-19. But the major thing again, so if you have symptoms, call your doctor, stay isolated. For symptoms, fever more than 37.5, cough, respiratory distress. I cannot emphasize enough in that case, Either call your doctor, go to the emergency department. That's when you want to go. Because sometimes this, uh, this virus acts very fast, in a matter of hours. You don't want to be that person. So if you can breathe, just go. If you don't, stay. If you don't have problem breathing, stay home, call your doctor, drink a lot, keep hydrated, the, um, use lozenger, like we call a cough drop lozenger to keep your, your mucosa uh, hydrated, okay? Because both bacteria and virus, if, you're, um, if your mucosa is dry, they get stuck. So you wanna keep drinking, drinking water. Next, please. So the problem with this vaccine is, first is uh, behaving in a very unusual way and is defying all of our knowledge. So none of us is an expert on this. And that's something to remember because you hear people say, oh, this or that. All we know is how to protect ourselves. But the structure of the virus and the behavior of the virus is something still totally unknown. Why in the same family? Some people can unfortunately die and others are doing very well. Uh, we don't know. Uh, there is also an hypothesis that why in certain population has affected us harder than other, that maybe there might be a genetic component. We don't know. So understanding where we don't know, and the one thing is we do know we don't have 
a vaccine. But what we do know is that the best way to prevent the illness is to avoid to be exposed to the virus. The virus transmit person to person. Between two people who are in close contact, less than six feet. The way the contact occurs is through the droplets. And so if the droplets, and I have a slide after that I maybe will give you a better visual image. If you are in the distance, yeah, of uh, the um, somebody that is either coughing or sneezing or even talking you can go to the other one even talking at time but they talk very loud like this like i'm talking now they will um not say with that they will still um emanate those droplets and those droplets if you are there close at six feet distance can infect you or they can fall on surfaces so like when we go to the supermarket or we touch uh, things in store we touch handles you know when we go in and out of, of different offices or supermarket so remember that this is the way to be infected through the droplet through the touch okay the the droplet the fomites which is a, the a infection and the aerosol virus so if we keep ourselves at least six feet distance and whenever we touch anything we go to the supermarket you know i have a system i touch everything but then i pay and as soon as i pay and i make sure i'm not touching my face then i wash my hand with a solution that should be 60 percent of alcohol and then as soon as i come home and I do, uh, oh, in fact, we're gonna talk about the surfaces. I leave the, the plastic bag, paper bag aside. I, uh, no, I, I, all outside and then I, I take all the, uh, the food and put it in the sink or just um, put it, uh, the, um, throw all the things in the sink and then put the, the bags in the, um, in the trash can okay because uh next one please and the reason for doing so if you cough you know the the um, cover your mouth and now we are having everybody wearing a mask and we're and the reason why and i'm going to repeat this a couple of times we are having everybody wearing a mask is not that we protect us but if we are asymptomatic and we are talking just like I'm talking, and the droplets go up to two meters. Then I and I have a mask. Where is my mask? But if I have a mask, you all know, then in that case, my droplet will stay here and don't go to anybody who is close to me, and they don't fall in any surface. So either I am symptomatic and I'm sneezing, they stay there, or if I'm asymptomatic and I'm even talking, they stay there. So the, everybody around me and the, all the things around me are protected. So if we can all do that, we are hoping to decrease the curve, to slower the curve of the infection. That's the, and that's why we, ban, we went uh, up, and, up and down, uh, mask yes, mask no, let's leave the mask for the doctor. Also, there was a real risk of people stealing masks, which has happened. Uh, it's happened to us being thousands of masks from hospitals, you know, and all you need is really also not necessarily a mask, a, a scarf. As long as you have a scarf, you know, and you are even talking or sneezing in that, then the people around you are protected. Next one, please. So you heard also different data on how much does it stay where? In the, um, I don't know, do you see my air? No, do you see, uh, let's start, aluminum is about five days and metals, uh, well, the most important is the, the wood in the, the, at the desk of work is about four days. Paper can be uh, 24 hours to four or five days, depending what the strain of the virus. You can go four or five days to 24 hours. 
the plastic up to five days. So again, the idea is, is not to make anybody paranoid, but realizing that there is a risk here and we have to be careful. So anything that we go to the supermarket, we go to, in my office, I have to tell you that I come in and I wipe everything. And then I go to see my patients, I have the mask, I have, in that case, I do have the gloves. When I come back, take out the gloves, and I still wipe things down, okay? Um, am I paranoid? I don't think so. Am I careful? Yes. So, uh, so clean, clean again. Open the door, clean your hands before you touch your, your interface. Oh, and one, uh, we will talk about the home. Next. Uh, so there are different, there are different, uh, wait, did we miss one slide or is it coming later? Yeah, it's coming later. Uh, so, uh, wait, um, no, 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 but it, okay. uh, no, by superlative. So the two major masks that are on the left, the surgical mask that we as doctors use in the hospital, you know, if we stay at two meters or six feet of distance. For people that are in the emergency department, like my husband, when I go to the intensive care to do consultation, then we wear the respirator mask, which is called an N95. People out there don't need an N95, okay? Unless you are intubating somebody, you know, you're at close contact because you're doing a procedure, or like when I go into intensive care and you have to put a valve for people to talk to you and you're right there. But otherwise, you don't need this. Next one, please. And the reason why the physician need that, the emergency medicine and critical care mostly, uh, everybody else can be okay with the uh, N95. Because the N95 is um, constructed in a way that the respirator blocks at least 95% of the very small 0 0.3 microns dust particle, okay? And these are only to be used by provider again that are working in proximity of the patient. And the reason why I emphasize this, because you know what? There are gonna be a lot of patients and a lot of physicians who need this mask. And there's been a lot of black market on this mask be sold outside. All we need as, as people outside the hospital or not in close contact with people is the either a surgical mask or a scarf or a cotton mask, okay? Um, some protection so that the particles don't arrive to us and washing the hands, washing the hands. Next, please. Okay, and if you are at home and you, uh, you have been exposed, like my husband and I, to um, patients, or you work in a supermarket, or you work in an environment that is, has uh, people around you that is crowded, then even at home, and these are our godchildren with the two kids, we make sure that they're all using a mask, and it's not a joke. Uh, they, she's a dentist, is also a doctor, they come home and the mask it is, and actually the kids are beginning to like, to love the mask. So <laughs> they, we made them believe there are some characters in a movie, but, <laughs> but they really, if you are exposed, even at home, if you are close and you have to hold your children and you're not keeping the distance because you don't know that you may be asymptomatic. And as you're talking, you're transmitting the, the virus. And I'm sure you've heard about stories of family that one after another got you get infected. There was a famous uh, family in New Jersey, right? The 11 of them, I think five of them got infected. So I cannot, I, I know you, I'm repeating this over and over. Don't scream because that's the most important message. If you sneeze or cough, cover your mouth. Mask, yes or no, we just talked about. Wash your hands often. So the way you wash your hands, with a lot of soap, the virus dies after 20 seconds on water and soap. 
and it dies on uh, um, a resolution of 60% of alpha. So this it is, then you, and you probably heard the singing of happy birthday, 22nd, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, but it's like this, like this, like the surgeon do, like this, then again, like this, like this, and you wash. And then when you wash, you turn, if you are in a public space, the sink with a, a tissue, okay? Because somebody else might have already touched it and you open the door of the bathroom with a tissue, all right? Um, sometimes people, we are used in a hospital, but people don't think of that. And that is not being obsessive compulsive, but it's being very responsible right now. And break, the, be the policeman of your own hands. Be aware every time where your hands are, okay? And maybe you can play a game with your kids. Whoever touches the face is gonna pay 25 cents, you know? And then, so you watch each other and it becomes like a game, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, because that's the way you touch your mouth, you touch your nose, you touch your eye. That's the way it gets transmitted. You stay away from people, you don't touch your face, you're not gonna get infected. That we know. We don't know a lot of things, but we know that, okay? Clean, uh, um, so uh, use the right cleaning product, 60% alcohol. So if you come from the grocery store, you put your, I normally put my grocery in the sink, wash them, and then put them away. But if you put them on a counter or whatever you do, then you clean that surface, okay? Um, clean your home. Oh, do you see Dr. Clementi? She has earphones. She's very smart. Because the bottom line, we don't realize that the phone okay. is the dirtiest thing in our hand. And then we go like this, right? And it's right in our face. I was at the grocery store the other day. They called me from the hospital. And I just went to pick it up. And I go, what am I doing? Right? Because I just touched the produce. I didn't wash my hands yet. And then I washed the phone and I washed my hands. But there are risks. That we shouldn't take so we're all going to imitate dr clementi seriously not a joke so um don't share utensil don't share towels at home again you can be asymptomatic don't do it keep your distance and if you have fever and cough this is not the time to be a hero this is the time to stay at home and stay in your own room at home and use your own towels and not share and figure out a way that somebody else is bringing you the food and when they pick the, or if you have a big dining room and you're lucky to do that so then you can sit the opposite side of the table and you just and then whoever picks up your your plate or you do it put it in the sink they wash their hands immediately okay and one important thing again if you have fever cough and shortness of breath, call your doctor, go to the emergency department, and before you, and you don't go to your doctor without calling. So when they, you arrive, they're ready for you. You protect them, they protect you, okay? Because at that point, they will have a mask, they will have gloves, everybody gets protected, all right? Um, so how do we keep safe at home? I have to tell you that even my husband and I, again, I told you we are physicians. We both know very well, unfortunately, and that how God help us, that we can potentially infect each other. So the way to do it, the way we tell everybody to do it, is leave the shoes at the door, leave the coat at the, at the entrance, buy a coat rack, or if you have already a closet, go straight to your bathroom. We I have now two separate bathrooms. We wash our phone. We take a shower because we are in contact with patients every day. You can just wash your hands, okay? Uh, if Ivana, you have, yes. sorry, I have a question. Uh, how long does it uh, resist on clothes, for example, the virus? On clothes. On clothes, we don't know for sure, depending on what the material is, but we think about 24 hours. Thank you. That's the most uh, thought of idea. Are we under percent? No. But if you let it hang and then, you know, and then uh, you, you just go and you wash yourself, should be okay. 
and also it's the outside, so you wear clothes does not seem to be an issue. The handle, the, the surfaces seem to be an issue. Okay, uh, but we leave shoes out, close the door, go to the bathroom, close your, um, clean your phone if it is with a wipe or an alcohol solution, and then wash your hands and then you're ready to meet your loved one, if you love them. <laughs> no, that's a bad joke. Yeah. Um, so, st and if you start a routine, and it, the brain works by repetition. So if you have a routine that, it, that you create a memory for that routine, okay? And then it will be easier. In the beginning, you will forget, like everybody else, but then it will be easier to follow a routine. So establish a routine for yourself and for your kid. You get home, leave everything, everybody washes their hands, and everybody still stays relatively far. And honestly, if you, again, have a situation where you have to go out, if you've been in isolation for a while, no. But if you meet people, you go out, I will wear a mask at home. So, uh, and I'm being overly protective, of course. So if you're immunocompromised or calls, but any symptom, you immediately call the doctor. Next, please. Okay. So if you have a fever, if you have cough, you're in isolation, that the, the guidelines have changed also. Before, it used to be 14 days. Now, as we know more, we think that you can leave three days after you have had no more fever and no more cough, okay? Without taking Tylenol or without taking what are Italian like very much, the tachypirina, but if you have three days without cough, without fever, now the recommendation is that you can go back to work, you can go, depending on who works, it depends on what works. For us, even for us physicians, after three days that we have no cough and no fever, we can go to work. You, whoever can stay at home, please, please stay at home for yourself, for your kids. And I know it's boring, but you have consider it a privilege. Consider it a privilege to build bonds with your kids that you didn't do before play games you didn't do before, uh, create something, look on their YouTube, they love to teach you about virtual tour, or, you know, maybe if you had planned a vacation somewhere, you go, okay, now we're gonna learn all about Rome. And you go on the YouTube and you learn with the kids, or game, or, you know, like I, 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 my godchildren that you saw before, they're learning of magic tricks whatever it is, okay? Um, but it, again, the recommendation before were 14 days, now it's three hours, three days after no cough and no fever, and uh, at least seven days uh, after the first symptoms. Next, please, Stefani. So now, to pause a little bit, we talked about all the physical symptoms, and I'm gonna talk about the real elephant in the room. What people in, in the media don't talk about, and even doctors enough, is that there is such a thing, and, and hear me about this, is a, of an acute stress disorder. Many of you might have experienced this after September 11th. Any of us, 99% of us, when we are exposed to a traumatic event in which both of the followings are present, either the person experienced, witnessed, or was confronted with an event or events that actually threatened their, their life, their, um, their death, or serious injury, or threatened the physical integrity to self or others, or the person response involved intense fear, helpless, or horror. The, many of us have experienced is the fear of the unknown. And not only the physical fear, is the economic, the fear of the economic disruption. All of us have been at some level experiencing, I'm sure, an element of acute stress disorder. And when we are stressed, uh, exposed to trauma, again, like September 11, but there was a little easier 
because there was a trauma, there was a beginning, there was an end very shortly. Here, the trauma repeats with the television, with the data of mortality, with our friends that tell us about their colleague or relative who is either being very sick or died on the intensive care. And then the trauma restarts. So my advice is choose, even with the family, to either read the paper, one news, but not over and over because the brain gets bombarded and gets traumatized all the time. Next, please. And what we experience is either people, uh, they experience what we call dissociative events. They either detach, they want to be alone. They feel that they're sometimes they're dizzy, out of space, or they keep in their head the images that they saw on television. That happened with September 11th. But here also the, the tragic story that hit all of us if there's a 30 year old that died in three hours or whatever it is. So, or some people experiences like agitation, irritability, they cannot sleep, they cannot focus, they cannot focus, you know, some of my staff said, you know, I can't do this, it takes me three hours to do what I could do before in half an hour. I myself had moments like this or you know, or they, they cannot function in their own work. And that is normal. 99.9% .9 of the population will have some of the symptoms or all of them. Some people will also start drinking in excess to try to numb themselves or using illicit drugs. So if you feel, and those symptoms normally last two days to two or four weeks. This is the, and that's what happened with September 11th. And it's normal reaction on everybody. You gotta know this because if you feel like that and you go, what's happening to me? I'm more irritable. Some people become even more violent, especially with living in the same close environment and throwing things and hitting each other and screaming at each other. Um, if you feel like that, know that it's normal, but also know that you can reach out for help. And Dr. Clementi and myself are here for that. Um, it, and she, you, she can put you in touch with, she can talk to your kids or to you, or put you in touch with other people. For me, I can definitely make myself available. And then depending on what the situation is, refer you to whoever is needed to, but we are here to support you, even for that, for your kids and for you. So again, normally the reaction, the acute stress syndrome disorder is two to four weeks, but because here we've been traumatized over and over again, it can be longer. And if you realize that they are not the same, you're reacting in a way that is getting in your wife, in your life, you can't focus, ask for help. Next one, please. Okay, and that's, uh, and, and that's what I was saying. As, if you find yourself not sleeping, not eating well, as for help, you can definitely, again, ask Dr. Clementi and me for help. Next, uh, Stefan. And the uh, good thing that you can do, in fact, I think like one of my colleague Italians said, I think we called this wrong in the wrong way. We should have said physical distancing, but social closeness. You want to have a social contact. You want to call your friends. You want your kids to call your family, the grandparents. You want to maybe participate. We're going to have a Passover tonight over Zoom with our grandchildren, you know? But do whatever it takes to keep yourself in, in, in socially close, but physically distant. What I was saying before, before take the opportunity to learn new new skill, you know? Um, I bought myself a guitar at age 66. I never played an instrument, but at least when I come home, I'm gonna try. Don't ask me in a few months what I've learned, but uh, at least I try. Just needing to detach for all that one season in the hospital every day. Plan a new skill, an instrument, I told you, magic tricks, uh, a virtual tour of a city that you always wanted to see with your kids, a virtual art tour. The Metropolitan offered great 
programs for the kids and the family. Um, exercise relaxa relaxation technique, meditation, uh, eat well, exercise, try to get this opportunity to get closer to the family and learning new skills. Next. And those things you can do. Again, taking care of ourselves in different ways that can help us. Treatment, I know you heard, I'm scratching my head, I see myself on the video, a lot of things about different medication, fluoroquine, uh, chloroquine, uh, ribavirin, uh, none of them so far have been proven. The good things, because unfortunately we have so many people who are sick, there are many trials that have been um, conducted I don't recommend anything to take anything unless it's part of a trial and under uh, doctor supervision, you know, because of um, what our president, chloroquine, chloroquine had been, uh, you know, everybody wants it, everybody is buying it off the market. You don't need to do that. Um, but God forbid you're sick, you'll be, and you want to. The art plan, your protocol, especially in this city, but everywhere to be given that if you want to. If you find, you know, I talked about an acute stress disorder. I also don't want to forget that people might have experienced anxiety or depression or psychosis at baseline. And that this situation with the fear of getting infected, cleaning up, makes things worse. If you find that your symptoms, your baseline symptoms are worse, if you find that you need excessive sedative that you might have also had for whatever reason, um, call your doctor. Call your doctor, ask for help. That's all I and <laughs> that's right. So we know how to protect ourselves, mask, wash our hands, and next one is oh, oh i didn't have the next one i guess yes that's my little goddaughter so but the helpline let's go back to it sorry let's go back to the helpline there are some um, help line you should not have your own doctor here is one the first one is a helpline from uh, sinai where you can schedule an appointment if you need an appointment with the, a dermatologist, gastroenterologist, uh, you can schedule an appointment within the week. The second uh, uh, helpline is you can schedule an appointment normally within the day. And then Mount Sinai now is an incredible resource, is a chat. So you have a doctor that will talk to you and you can uh, uh, go over your symptoms and when they direct you to either an urgent care or, or the emergency department, whatever you need to. But that is an incredible resource. If you read anything, uh, instead of reading whatever is out, different journalists and different paper and different data, look at the CDC guideline, look at the World Health Organization. Those are reliable sources. That's what I would recommend. If there is a mental health issue, again and again, you know Dr. Clementi, many of you know me, some of you, you, you just met me, uh, please reach out to us. And with that, I wonder if I can still see who is uh, any of the parents, uh, if I can meet them virtually or... Proviamo. Allora. Mm. Not really. <laughs> okay, well, I hope that... I'm mute. Oh, now maybe someone can talk. I, hope yeah, but I have a lot of questions for you anyway. I hope I can meet you when finally the gala will occur. Yeah. Is, uh, the word is go. I will come. We are uh, emotionally supportive of the uh, Italian school. So I hope I meet you all then. Thank you so much. Silvana, we have... I'm receiving a lot of questions, also now, live. Allora, the first one is, um, if a mother of a newborn gets the virus, can she still breastfeed her baby, or is it better for her to pump the milk and have her husband feed the baby? Uh, definitely pump the milk. 
And um, actually somebody else asked me that question. This is not an area of my expertise. So I did ask uh, one of our pediatricians and uh, the recommendation now is pump the milk and have uh, the, the, the father give the baby, uh, give the milk and also be separate from both the father and the child. So be in a separate room if they can and if they can, you know, keep the distance the, 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 as possible and wash their hands, but definitely keep the distance from the baby. The good thing is that children, you know, less than 10 years old uh, uh, have not been at an incredible risk. There have been very few cases. And some of those kids already had a pre-existing condition or immunocompromised, so that, but still. More questions. Allora, abbiamo una persona che ha alzato la mano, la professoressa Baldassarri. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Sì. I can hear you. I cannot see you, but I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I have a question. When you showed the table with the uh, time, um, the time frame of the virus uh, on uh, materials, so yeah. it's like uh, if I'm not misunderstanding. So if we put uh, food in the refrigerator, the virus is going to stay longer? No, 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 no. You clean, you clean everything before. You clean everything before you put it in the refrigerator. We you have wash to clean it. Right. You have to clean things. This is the time that we have to clean. I told you, put everything in the sink, wash everything in water and soap, then rinse very, very well. You dry it and you put it in the refrigerator. It's going to be an incredible amount of work, but if that means our health, this is the time to do it. You know, we're all going to have to have a little part of obsessive compulsion, but it needs to be done. We don't have a choice. Thank you. Is it, is it okay to use soap and water? So, with, yeah, but you rinse very well. With vegetable water? If you take things packaging plastic that have been in a, in a shelter, in a shelter, in a shelf, uh, and people, again, can uh, sneeze on it. So take it out of the plastic, put it in a Ziploc, right? You wash your hands, you take it out, you wash the plastic first. I know it's a lot of work. You take it out, you put it in a Ziploc, and then you put it in the refrigerator. Don't put anything that is wrapping paper or plastic from the store in the refrigerator. That's our advice yeah, as physicians. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. It keep, it's going to keep us all extremely busy, but necessarily so. Okay. Um, another question. Um, a friend of mine had coronavirus and she was better after 21 days. So during the coronavirus time, she had no sense of smell and taste. And after the two negative tests certifying her complete coming out of the illness, she still has a bad perception of smell and taste. Is it normal? Yeah, and we don't know yet exactly. Normally it goes away pretty quickly. Uh, very few people have it for longer. We expect that it will go away, but we don't, we don't have enough uh, cases or study to know exactly what the average is. But uh, yes. Another question, uh, Silvana. Uh, are there any permanent damages after having COVID-19 that you know? Permanent damages or what? Any permanent damages, something that stays with well, you even it, after you are. Well, it, really depends, it really depends on the severity of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Normally people recover, you know, if they had terrible pneumonia, they've been intubated, could they be left with a, a more susceptible respiratory, uh, upper respiratory system? That's true of every pneumonia, possibly. Okay, thank you. But that's the risk of everybody that gets any type of pneumonia. You know, normally they get better. It may just take a month, it may just take a little bit more than a month to recover, like any pneumonia, and then people recover. Is there the unlucky person that maybe already had some respiratory problem at baseline or some asthma, and now is so unlucky to be intubated that will uh, be left with a weak respiratory system? 
maybe. But you know what? Let's, I hope I didn't, I hope I gave the positive message of all the things that we can do to help ourselves and to try to distract ourselves when we worry about the what if that we start thinking about something, and I'm not joking, something new. If it's play the guitar, if it's learning a new skill, uh, if it's talking to the family, distraction is the best medicine, guys. And we need to move our uh, attention to something positive because this has affected all of us and our fear of the unknown. And you know what, what I really believe as a psychiatrist, as a neurologist, that and working with athletes in human performance, you know that our worst enemy is the fear of the fear because we're going to believe in our fear. Sure, not having control of the situation. And Dr. Clementi and I have talked about this many times. You know, you start believing in your fears that you're going to be dead tomorrow and you're going to be miserable. You know, or that everything is going to be lost in the market and you're going to be miserable. So when we start experiencing fear, whatever needs to be done, do it. If it's relaxation technique, is a, is a funny movie. You know, it's like when people have cancer that all of a sudden, you know, uh, have the, the old world crumbles, you know. And um, I've been there, you know, and uh, there are ways of distracting yourself. Funny movie, funny story. Um, do what you can. We, we have some power here to make ourselves better. Thank you. Another one. Uh, do we have to wear gloves and masks even if we walk around the block? Remember, so the, glo the, the, the mask we are wearing if we are on the elevator and somebody talks to us and is asymptomatic or they're sneezing at us, so their, their virus gets contained in their mask. So if we walk, you know, the best way if we walk in an open area where there are no people, no, you don't. But if you, and if you keep uh, social distancing, no, you don't. But if you go around and you go to the supermarket, then uh, uh, you do. So the best way is do it. So you don't have to think, also because of that's right. What I thought I said in the beginning with Dr. Uh, Clementi was, uh, the, did this with the mask, the risk of the mask. So it's better to put your mask on with your hands clean and take it out when you get home with your hands clean. Because the risk of the mask is then you fix it, you touch your mouth, you take it out, you take it back. And now what you've done, you touch your face more often. So instead of protecting yourself, you don't. The gloves, some people, you don't need gloves definitely on the street. Some people love to wear gloves if they go to the supermarket. Uh, and me personally, I like to have my hands free so I know what I touch and then I touch my hands because sometimes with the gloves you get that full sense of security and then you pick up your phone with your gloves or because I have my gloves, but the gloves are dirty. Okay? okay. So the answer is no. If you feel more comfortable, you know, when you're out, because that reminds you not to shake hands or to not touch things, is a personal thing. But, you know, the gloves is for physician when they touch patient, they're in the hospital, really, otherwise. So for families with children, Silvana, uh, is, it, um, is it okay to go outside to the park for one hour every day, uh, being, of course, careful uh, of not touching uh, anything and um, just for a run for not play with other kids you know ask the mother please you know one of my colleagues was saying went to the park and all of a sudden there is this uh, mother and kid are running at their kid and she had to say please 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 so if uh, you know kids love to touch a mouth running uh, you, you know taking a walk in the park playing in the little jostre, whatever, I would discourage it. Okay. Because they don't know, because the kids, it's hard for the kids. Now, <laughs> to keep them. Up, but, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, but taking a walk with the kids, physically this time. Every day, one hour. Sure. Okay. Again, you know, but don't touch anything else and nobody else. Not having friends in the house. This is not the time. 
that I was talking with the council about this. This is not the time. It's time to be social distance. Yeah. But because yes is your friend, yes is your cousin. You don't know where they've been. You don't know what they have. Uh, and if you are at home with your with your family, then you know. And if you go out and then you take all the precaution, like we talked when we come in, then you know that your environment is safe. But with other people, you don't know. The risk is too high. That's another. My, that is my recommendation and is my opinion. And, okay. Grazie. Um, another interesting question: Is there any food that you can recommend that we could eat to prevent the the virus, I mean, of course, vitamins. Like with every other infection, uh, vitamin C is one, vitamin D and zinc have been uh, uh, recommended. As long as you understand that there are no control studies, but that, you know, through the ages, we go eat your oranges, get your vitamin C. So a good diet is recommended for protecting us from any infection and that's a bad you can do but I wouldn't recommend one versus the other or start taking a million of vitamins you know perfetto grazie so, eat well frutta verdura exercise uh, last two uh, questions um, the first one is is it safe to go out for a run ah. Ha. so yeah this is mine. You know, it, it depends where you're running. Like in the beginning, I found myself running around the reservoir. As I told you, as other people going, and I didn't have a mask. Not safe. If you go and run, you know, where there are no other people running and blowing, and then you have your mask. But, and if you go with somebody, you still keep your distance, then enjoy it. Thanks. So the last one. The message is, I don't want to give you know that we have to be careful. Distance and washing our hands. Those two messages, I think, I hope that are clear. The last question. I think so. The last question, and I think it's a question that we all have for you. Right. Uh, how would you evaluate when it is safe to return to our normal daily routines and to discontinue our isolation measures? Aha, I yeah. wish I had the crystal ball. Yeah. So the answer is we don't know yet. And uh, in New York, I hope, we hope, as I hear the reports of this morning, there has been a stable co curve in the last three days. I knock on wood, on, uh, on whatever it is, a ferro, talk of ferro. If we go this way, and we'll see in the next two weeks, I think we'll have a better sense of where we're going. We are seeing that in Italy, they're going in the right direction. Basically, what we're looking at, what is the number of infected people every day? Once that number goes down, and the ratio is one to one infection, and not one to 10, then we're going to be much safer because that means we reach, we reach a bigger immunity within the population. Doesn't mean that nobody is going to be infected anymore, but the chance for that is going to be much lower. So we have to all cross our finger, really pray and uh, see which way are we going in the next uh, couple of weeks. Nobody knows. You know, the virus is amazing. Has defied all of us, all the virologists, all the scientists in the world. The beautiful thing is that the scientist community has come together to do a research study together. Hopefully, we will learn a lot about this and hopefully, we will come out with a vaccine, I hope, relatively soon. That's our hope. Um, and if we get that, then we'll be a big step, a uh, huge step, like with influenza H1N1, you know? Mm -hmm. We had the vaccine, then uh, it didn't mean that nobody is going to be infected anymore, and that the number are much lower. Same thing like influenza. Thank you so much, Silvana. Really, I yeah, think the scientists between the parents, uh, so that we hope to find the vaccine. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Silvana. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our oh. audience. 
Uh, yeah. People don't, I didn't leave my number on the slide, but I can leave the number of my office if people have questions, if you're free to call. If it's an emergency, say it's an emergency. Otherwise, I will answer at the end of the day. I might not answer, you know, immediately, uh, but I will answer at the end of the day. And the number is 212-774-1300. There will always be somebody answering 24-7. And they will a message to me. And uh, so if it's an emergency, you say emergency. Otherwise, please say, call me when you can. And I will at the end of the day. Thank you for your great advice. And everyone, let's stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you for inviting me this forum again. This for Italia is in my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank to everyone. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.